A month long international MBA program. And in my role as an economist, I'm a moderator for this panel, which is titled Global Trade Outlook Implications for Business. There's an extra word in the title that's not showing there. It's the uncertain global trade outlook. And the uncertainty, of course, stems from actions by the United States, stems from actions by the administration to pull out of different trade negotiations, and importantly, to threaten tariffs and to impose tariffs. And that is bringing a lot of uncertainty to the world market. And we have five panelists here with a tremendous amount of experience in supply chain management, in trade relations, in trade policy. And I'll introduce them briefly and then ask them some questions. And some of them will respond the old fashioned way and talk to you, talk to me about the questions. Some will illustrate their points with a few slides. So let me briefly uh, introduce our panelists and then we will, we will begin. But to preface that on the uncertainty, in mid-March, I had a, a luncheon meeting with a senior Chinese diplomat, and I asked him what he thought China's response might be to the threat or possibly the enactment of, of tariffs on Chinese $50 billion worth of Chinese goods. And he responded instantaneously. It, it, it was a response that was uh, thought out. And he responded with three ideas in total of 20 words. China does not seek a trade war. China is not afraid of a trade war. China will not be bullied. And I think his statements uh, reflect the reality we're seeing with new announcements this morning. So I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists and then ask them to begin. Uh, our first speaker is Jeff Weiss. Jeff is a partner in the DC law firm Venable. Uh, he's a partner in the International Trade Group. He focuses his practice on resolving market access issues related to product and digital regulation and standards. Uh, he has worked in the Department of Commerce at a very high level. He's worked in the Office of Management and Budget. He's worked at USTR. He has a lot of experience in trade negotiations, and, and uh, we're very interested in hearing what Jeff is going to talk to us about. Secondly, uh, the next uh, panelist is Dan Krasenstein. Dan is the director of Asia operations for Procon Pacific, an industrial packaging firm, and has been a supply chain practitioner in Asia and Latin America for 30 years. He's a past governor with the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, and was also chair of the supply chain committee. And very importantly, he's an alumnus of the Global Supply Chain Management Master's Program. Thank you, Dan. And our third panelist uh, is Guido Gies. And Guido is the managing director of Dasher Air and Sea Logistics Americas. He oversees the business development for all of the Americas, including North, Central, and South America. He's responsible for connecting the Latin American economies to the Dasher Worldwide Network, and ideally to seamlessly integrate these economies. Thank you, Guido. And fourth is Ricardo Vera. Ricardo is the Director of Operations of MechFlex, a supply chain management firm, warehousing firm, and is a senior executive with broad international experience in supply chain uh, planning and execution. And last but not least is Professor P.J. Guan Go, who's an associate professor at the Business School of the National University of Singapore. Prior to that, he had 20 years of corporate experience throughout Asia in general management, strategic planning, and commercial investments. Okay, let's start out with Jeff. Jeff, tell us something about the trade environment and what you think, what you think is happening today and what you think will be happening tomorrow. 
As we, as we say in D.C., the situation is fluid. So uh, every morning we wake up to, to new, uh, new news, some, some things we haven't seen before. So I think to start off, it's important to note that there is a, a general consensus in the, in the Washington trade policy community that the administration has a point about IP theft by China, about, about steel over capacity, about circumvention of anti-dumping countervailing duties. I think the question is, how do you address some of those things? And it's really difficult to do that in Geneva. We haven't had a single undertaking uh, since 1994. And we tried negotiating with China in a bilateral investment treaty in the last administration to cover some of these issues, and we weren't able to make much progress. So the administration has imposed, uh, or is in the process of imposing, several different types of tariffs and, and TRQs. First under Section 201 of the Trade Act of 1974 on solar panels and washing machines. Uh, then Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962 on steel and aluminum. And the autos are in process, uranium and others are potentially coming. Uh, and then Section 301 tariffs uh, against China for IP theft. Um, and under both 232 and 301, we've seen retaliation. Uh, and just this morning, uh, China announced that it was considering another $60 billion worth of U.S. goods to target with 25% tariffs. So it's just going to keep ratcheting up. As we heard yesterday from, from Gene Soroka, 20% of the volume uh, of uh, imports and exports to the port of L.A. is impacted. 50% of the products coming in or going into U.S. manufacturing. So I think this is a really important point. What Gene told us yesterday is 50% of the imports coming through the port are intermediate goods. So if these tariffs go on, these intermediate goods, either company profits are going down or they have to raise prices substantially. And I think what's important to note is that 232 and 301 232 is very rarely used, and you're justifying it based on national security. So it's self-judging, so that opens up a lot, of, a lot of different possibilities for others. I was the U.S. digital negotiator uh, a couple years ago, and we were negotiating with China and Russia in the G20 on this very issue when it came to cybersecurity. They wanted to use national security as a justification for almost any kind of measure. So you can see how that could be deployed the opposite way. And 301, we actually lost a case at the WTO in 1998 to the EU. So I never thought I'd see us use it since 1998 because it was found to be WTO inconsistent. So I think the idea is to, is to generate leverage to get China to change its behavior. Uh, but as supply chain experts know, this is very complicated. So some US companies are in favor of the tariffs. Others are against the tariffs. But, but Other you know, excuse, are excuse me. You mentioned China. I mentioned China. I started with China. Right. But our steel tariffs are on Japan. They're on Canada. They're on Mexico. What are we doing? Well, I think that. I mean, what is the administration? Doing? <laughs> I think they're trying to tackle a lot of different issues at once. I think that there's been a bit of a tipping point where I think there's been a realization that maybe they need to focus on China. I think the auto hearing for the 232 tariffs on July 19th, there were 45 entities that testified, and I believe that 44 testified against, and then one testified, uh, said they were, they were kind of lukewarm to the idea. So I think they've been looking for a reason to kind of back off the tariffs a little bit. So we had the agreement with Juncker uh, on, on the auto tariffs. I think that was the last week or week before. Japan is going to be coming in. They want the same deal. Now there's a push to try to settle the automotive rules of origin issues in NAFTA. So even if there isn't a final agreement, then the administration doesn't have to impose auto tariffs on Canada and Mexico. So I think they're starting to pull back from that and focus more on China. But it's going to take time to unwind that and then come up with a, a positive strategy, which has to be consolidated with all of our allies. Do you think the administration believes some of its rhetoric that these, the tariffs were threatening or, or implementing are to reduce America's bilateral trade deficit with China or with Germany or with anybody else? I think they do. I think personnel is policy. I think if you look at 
the, the folks that the president has appointed to key positions at USTR and Commerce. They either have an anti-China background or they've been petitioner's counsel in anti-dumping countervailing duty cases for a long time. And so they feel that if consumer industries are being hit now, they've been getting artificially low prices for these goods for a long time, and so it's time for a rebalancing. So I do believe that they, they are committed to this strategy and they want to see a, a rebalancing. Yeah, the Undersecretary of Commerce, who has been a, uh, an advocate of tariffs for a long time, uh, was here at our, our Asia Pacific Business Outlook conference in, Mar in April. And he said, yes, these tariffs are going to uh, eliminate our bilateral deficits. Well, obviously, he and, and some of his colleagues have never taken Econ 101. Uh, the tariffs are not going to reduce our, our deficits, uh, our overall deficit. Our overall deficit is caused by our spending and savings uh, functions. And in, in fact, our overall deficit is going to go up because of big tax cuts, unless there's a big cut in government uh, uh, spending. I mean, I also think it's complicated. If you look at what the semiconductor manufacturers are saying, 90% of the values in the US, the design and the manufacturer, they ship the products to China for final assembly, packaging, and labeling, and it's coming back with a 25% tariff. So just focusing on the tariff subheading without looking at the supply chain, you could potentially cause more issues, which is that they're gonna have to sort through in the exclusion process, which is gonna take time. Jeff, do you, th do you think that the tariffs on China both the, the ones that have been uh, implemented and the ones that are threatened, will lead to a change in intellectual property issues, will lead to a change, in, and I'm going to ask Dan to speak on this more because he's sitting in China, but will lead to a, a change in China's requirement to, for joint ventures and China's requirement to uh, share intellectual property? Is the tariff threat going to motivate the Chinese to do that? Well, I think the standoff is going to go on for quite some time. I don't think anything is going to get resolved before the election. I think China is probably going to, going to continue to wait. The longer it goes on, the more they're going to see what's happening in the U.S. Everyone asking for relief. Uh, we've tried to negotiate on these issues both multilaterally and bilaterally with China for a very long time and haven't been able to achieve success. I think it's going to be a combination of this plus joint action with our allies, which is why I think it's an important step to start pulling back the tariffs because the EU and Japan are just as concerned as we are. Whenever I had an issue, a regulatory issue with China, uh, I got a much better result if I went in with the EU and Japan next to me than if I tried to do it myself. Um, so I definitely think that will help. I also think we have to have more of a presence in the Asia, in the Asia Pacific. So we have to figure out if we're not going to do TPP, what are we going to do? So this sounds very rational, but it doesn't sound like the administration. I mean, what we've done is we've irked our Japanese allies, we've irked our European allies, and these are people we need to, to help us negotiate. Do you think that the process is now they're stepping back enough to, to bring the Europeans to think of us as trusted partners, to think of the Japanese and to think of us as trusted partners again? It looks like it, but again, the situation is fluid. We, we're seeing lots of different things. Is that something taught in law school, the situation is fluid? <laughs> So I, I don't think anyone saw the de-escalation with the EU coming until we started seeing press reports in the morning. Um, and then at the same time, getting tougher with, with China. And after the announcement today about the 60 billion, I wouldn't be surprised if the president says, okay, we're gonna go for the full 500 billion because they can't match us dollar for dollar, but they can match us on things like merger review and changing anti-dumping countervailing duties and things with airlines, and there are lots of things that they've been deploying non-transparent means to try to balance it out. Uh, I do think that there is a potential way uh, of getting more leverage, uh, and, and this is my big idea. Everyone in this room knows that supply chain is trade, that the cargo movement is trade, but it's never been part of trade agreements. It wasn't part of TPP. Everything in Washington is stovepipe. You have trade agencies and transportation agencies, trade committees, transportation committees, um, and they really need to be integrated. And I feel like what we could do is put forward with our allies in the Pacific an alternative to One Belt, One Road as a way of re-engaging and bringing trade and supply chain logistics together. I think that Nick's put together a great team here. 
Secretary of Commerce has a great advisory committee on supply chain competitiveness. Together, they can put together some recommendations. I think infrastructure is something the President cares a lot about. He also cares about uh, geopolitics. And if you look at the U.S. national security strategy, they talk a lot about U.S. leadership in maritime, on infrastructure, and, and technology. So I think there is a way consistent with their policy to kind of move us in the right direction. But it's going to take a little bit of time. I, I hope you're right. Before we go to the next panelist, do any of the panelists have a question or a comment? You can disagree with Jeff, or you can agree, or can you elaborate? Guido. What, what, uh, what Jeff said, especially we're very close to the automotive industry as a logistics provider. And what you have to know that uh, when you build a car, it's over 30,000 parts, and they build components. And there are hundreds of companies making sure that the car is being built. So going to a German company, producing cars in Spartanburg, South Carolina, so these guys exporting from South Carolina 70% of their production into the world. Now, by imposing duties and taxes on, on, a, on a natural supply chain, they don't have under control because they basically buy 90% of the components of a global procurement through these hundreds of companies. They, they pay 25% or 10% duties and taxes. And when they export them to China, they have to do it another time. So usually that car manufacturer is moving the platform of certain cars because they don't build all the cars in one factory. Those platforms are being moved then to the local markets. And it's, it's a snip, you know, for them. It's not a problem to use it either in South Africa or Mexico or China. So what we're going to see, and we can see that with our customers already, that the export is decreasing as well, it's being impacted. And, and it's not that easy that you think that you can with one tariff, you can give it a stop sign and then, then obviously there's a right point, the deficit is big, but uh, the global supply will, will look, look for other ways and means to, to produce in the cheapest way and bring the, uh, the, product, uh, the products to the customers. So, so you think the, the auto manufacturers have enough political clout to change the administration's policies? I think they're lobbying pretty strong at the moment, and obviously there's a, there's a backup at the moment because there was a discussion to impose about 25% on full, full body automobiles. But once this is in place, I, I would say that cars being manufactured in the use eventually will be manufactured somewhere else because it makes no sense that there's no way that the, the global sourcing is stopped somewhere and you can source it here in the US. We work as well with uh, steel importers or with, with big companies who use steel. And, and they say at that moment uh, the prices were imposed or the, uh, the taxes were imposed, the domestic steel uh, manufacturing increased the price by 20% too. So the, the prices have to be given to the customers as well. And there's, there's a point where the customer is not paying 25%. I don't see that. Okay, this supply chain with 300 parts is too complicated. 30,000 parts. 30,000 parts is too complicated for me. Tell the story of lobsters how you lost your business shipping lobsters from Massachusetts to China. Yes, we, we, this is very simple. What the, person, I yes, we, the, the fisherman where we do the business for is a corporation. It's uh, approximately 2,000 tons of air freight going to China because they love the lobster from, from us. It went away overnight, yes. And it went, it, to, went to Canada. So the Chinese are going to eat lobsters from Newfoundland yes, instead of from Massachusetts. Yes, so we, we feel that, and the, the other things we feel as well, companies saying, we have a business plan now, they import steel, we have a business plan for 2019 to build up our factory. So there's a truth in everything that's not, we have to see what is the impact for the, for the, for the country, for the US, but definitely it has a heavy impact on, on, on the procurement of products. Sure. So that lobster example is indicative of US's allies not being alive with us. And as Jeff and I were talking earlier, without West, let's say Germany, France, England, throw Brazil and Australia and Canada into the mix, if they don't have a similar type of pressure on China to comply with World Trade Organization rules and regulations of, of trade technology, of hacking into computers, of fair trade, if you will, according to the US definition or WTO's definition. And if our allies don't play the same game of pressuring China, they'll use it for their own selfish advantage of just dealing U.S.'s export business. It's already happening with soybeans. It's already happening with lobsters and other products. So without them working with the United States, A, it's going to fail, and B, the bullying of China won't work because the Chinese government can't let it work. 
to its own people, just like Trump is playing to domestic politics. Xi Jinping is doing the same with his own politics. If he's seen to back down to Trump's pressure, he will lose power. And the, 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 the central party in China is a single party rule. And its deal with its own people is, don't challenge me with democratic ideas, and I will help you get rich. That's the big deal, right? So if he's seen as backing down, he will lose face with, amongst his own Chinese people of, again, China being colonized, uh, colonized or beaten up by the world as it has historically. So for pride reasons and honor reasons, there's no way the Chinese government can back down. And there's a Chinese expression, to churku, it basically means to eat bitterness. That their willingness, their willingness to endure hardship is almost a symbol of pride, that they're willing to do so. And that's what's missing in this whole equation, that the Trump administration assumes that China will react with logical economic reason and make decisions accordingly. They're playing by a different game. They're playing a different game than we're playing. They're willing to take the risk to allow their economy to crash and refocus on domestic economy and other parts of the world. So there's no way this is going to end with a happy ending. It's going to get up. Well, and there's, there's no reason for our European friends or our Canadian friends to really collaborate in this grand bargain that you're hinting at. Absolutely not. When, when the president insults the Canadian prime minister, when the president tells uh, Mrs. Merkel that Germany is an enemy of ours, it's an unfair traitor, and so on and so forth. If you really want this collaboration, you, and we, we all know how friendships are developed and cultivated. It takes a long time to create professional friendships. It takes a very short time to, to lose credibility. PJ, a voice from, uh, from Singapore, please. I guess I can add a point uh, around this, uh, which is that companies will actually arbitrage uh, trade regulations and FTAs. Uh, around what they do, so it's kind of similar to what they have pointed out about uh, coordination. So it's not to say, I'm not trying to say who's right or who's wrong, but as long as there are differences in like uh, FTAs and trade regulations, companies would find ways to arbitrage that uh, to maximize their profit, right, or to maximize their exports, uh, you know, using the existing tariff structures. So just to give a couple examples, right, and you talk about steel tariffs, uh, which is making the news recently, right, but even a few years ago, there were already um, uh, sort of import quotas within the US and Europe, right? And, and, and those quotas have been there all along. And so what we saw, uh, and I was in the industrial park business before I joined academia, so I was uh, uh, you know, in the industrial park business in Southeast Asia, so we in Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and we looked at Myanmar as well. So what we saw was that, uh, you know, we had Chinese companies that would move their operations to Indonesia, and they would do production over there. So they'll import <coughs> excuse me, um, raw steel <coughs> into Indonesia, and they would then um, reprocess it, and then they'll ship it out uh, you know, into the US or into Europe, whatever, right? So that's a way that they can actually get around these kind of um, quotas or you know, trade barriers in that sense. And it's, it's all legal, right? Because all you need to do is to hire people and have enough local content to, to get around it. And, and then actually, uh, you know, uh, at one point when you talk about TPP, it was also the same thing. Because then you had a lot of companies that would move uh, or set up uh, a lot of Chinese companies or Hong Kong companies, in fact, setting up textile factories in Vietnam in anticipation that that would then allow them to, you know, export into, uh, into the US when, when, when the TPP took effect, right? So, so actually, you know, as long as you know, uh, can, different countries have got different rules or different regulations or different trade agreements than uh, any global company right, or any multinational company would use, you know, uh, their ingenuity right, to actually find ways around it and, and do it legally, right, to, to get the lowest cost of supply chain. That brings us exactly to Dan's principal topic here, supply chain shift. Dan, tell us a little bit about why labor-intensive manufacturing operations are moving out of China to South and Southeast Asia, and how the threatened and actual tariffs might be accelerating that process. I'm going to use a PowerPoint to walk through that. And my, 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 my point is this. Prior to the, uh, the tariff escalations, 
There's already been a supply chain shift from China to South Asia, primarily India, and Southeast, Southeast Asia, primarily Vietnam. And that's mostly caused by labor cost increases in China. So the, I'm going to use my company as a, as, a, as a specific example. Instead of talking generalities, I'm going to walk you through what's happened to us as an example of many of my peers as well in Shanghai who are in purchasing or supply chain functions. Across industries, we're all facing the same function. So many of us who are based in Shanghai, like I am now, are increasingly flying to Mumbai, increasingly flying to Ho Chi Minh to follow our supply chain, and our supply chains are being stretched. So again, this is all prior to the tariff escalations. All that's doing is essentially escalating, or accelerating, if you will, a process already underway. Um, a little bit about me, again, the, tro the Trojan background. I just turned it off, great. There we go. All right, what do I do? I picked it up. All right, Look, our company, we manufacture polypropylene bags, also called big bags or super sacks. Labor intensive, it's made from polypropylene. So oil is 40% of the cost of the product. The other 40%, another 40% is labor, 20% miscellaneous. So a labor intensive product made sense to make in China 10, 15 years ago. The problem is now, as, as labor costs, I'm gonna walk you through this in a second, but in, in, in local currency, RMB or Chinese Yuan, uh, terms, we went from 1,500 RMB a month labor salary 10 years ago, doubled to 3,000 five years ago, now it's up to almost 6,000, which is roughly 1,000 US dollars. So a typical blue collar factory worker using a heavy industrial sewing machine is making almost 1,000 US dollars a month today. Well, there's only so much our customers are willing to pay for a polypropylene bag. Eventually it becomes cost prohibitive to manufacture in China, that's one problem, labor cost inflation. Second problem is uh, labor displacement. The workers, even if you're willing to pay 1,000 US a month, they're not from the coastal provinces where traditional manufacturing takes place in China, from Shandong down to Guangdong. They're mostly from Hunan or Anhui or the poorer hinterland far agricultural provinces who come for economic opportunities to work. They're no longer willing to work for $1,000. They're not their parents' generation who are willing, as I said before, to chirk, to eat the bitterness, to make money to provide the best life for their children. They're thinking, why the heck am I doing that when I can stay in my hometown with my spouse, with my parents, with my child, earn less salary, but my cost of living is less, I'm happier. So therefore, it's harder to find the workers even if you're willing to pay the price. That's what's causing this supply chain shift to South Asia and Southeast Asia who are more than willing to take on the, the, the production. What are they doing? There we go. So I, I had three topics I was going to speak on. The first one is the supply chain shift. The second one is relevant for the first topic Jeff was speaking to is US and China on divergent paths. So I'm going to skip the third one, but com combine the two in a very fast moving PowerPoint because I probably have limited time. Again, this is something that has happened historically. It's a busy map, but it's essentially saying what's happening now happened previously. And history always repeats itself. In the 1970s, Japan was the world's factory. As labor costs in Japan increased, the, the four tigers in the 80s, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, took over the manufacturing. As labor costs increased in those countries, and I was living in Taiwan in the mid 80s, so I witnessed this, all the Taiwan factories, South Korean factories, Singapore and Hong Kong factories moved into mainland China to take advantage of low cost labor. By the way, all these slides, if you're interested, I'll just share them with you, it's nothing proprietary. I see a lot of pictures there. Um, and now it's happening again, and it's natural. It's not that the manufacturers will leave China, but the labor-intensive ones have already left. I mean, look at your underwear. It's probably made in Vietnam already, or, or your, your running shoes. The point is this, it's already started. It's already moved to Vietnam. It's already moved to India. And in fact, it's very fluid. As you say, the situation is fluid. I think that if I'm quoting your phrase, it's already now my textile friends, who I know in Asia, are already moving to Ethiopia. The new peace accords between Ethiopia, Somalia, and Eritrea makes that the primary opportunity for manufacturing, low-cost labor. Um, or on the other side, in Ghana and Nigeria, a lot of textile manufacturers are going there as well, closer proximity to the United States. There's another opportunity there. So what I'm basically saying is this is happening, and it's going to happen again. Uh, this is uh, showing the wages. This is in RMB terms. Um, and I put together this slide. Please don't hold me to the numbers. I used this at a class I was teaching in China, and I got challenged on the numbers. I said, don't focus on the numbers, just focus on the comparison, the bottom line. I tried to take a sewing worker in China, in Vietnam, and in India, look at a local currency, convert to US dollar just with exchange rate, 
and then take productivity. The Chinese worker is extremely productive. So one Chinese sewing worker, you'd need two or three Indian sewing workers to make the same number of bags per day. And it's, it's more subjective. And from my experience, this is, these are my numbers. You can challenge it, I welcome it. Then I said, okay, on a monthly salary, how much are they making? Take it down to the day basis, and then down to the bag basis. Give or take, I'm basically saying India is 40% cheaper. So why wouldn't I go there? And I'm gonna to allude to some of the reasons why. Vietnam, that did grab a lot of the business, is losing it already, because their cost of labor escalated even faster than China. Uh, this just shows you our own company. It's a busy graph, but it shows you, uh, 10 years ago, we were 100% Jiangsu province, which is about an hour west of Shanghai. Quickly, because of cost issues within China, we moved about 20% to Shandong up in the north. Now we added Chongqing uh, three years ago. Today, this is actual today, I'm already 40% South and Southeast Asia. And again, that's just changing. It has nothing to do with Trump tariffs. This is just labor costs. Um, some comparisons of within China, the cost issues. This is, uh, if Noel's still in the room, this is the slide I was gonna share with him later. Basically, this takes my supply chain. I'm spoiled rotten by roughly three week transit time from Shanghai or Qingdao into LA. In fact, we go into Chicago, so we're mostly using Prince Rupert. Uh, sorry, uh, Gene and Noel. We're mostly going over Prince Rupert into Chicago, uh, taking advantage of double stack train service from Prince Rupert in the, in the Midwest. And we're getting about 25 day transit times into Chicago. Fantastic infrastructure, China's world-class infrastructure. Now I'm being forced because of labor to shift my production to mostly India, where infrastructure, pardon me, please don't be offended, infrastructure sucks. And it's, it's really difficult to operate in India when it rains, when there's congestion at the ports, um, when there's monsoons, or if you're eastern India, if you're going over Calcutta, Chennai, you have to do a transshipment over Colombo, Sri Lanka, you often miss it because of capacity issues, and then your transit times go through the roof, Whereas Western India is a little bit better, and that's what I'm going to jump into here, why Western India, for us, has been the answer. So the port of Mundra in Gujarat State, through the Suez Canal, has about 24-day service, weekly or twice a week service, and that's where a lot of the highly skilled labor is located. Um, again, why leave China now? Labor cost increases, labor displacement, RMB appreciation, cost of compliance is another big issue. I had two of my factories in Shandong got shut down last year, July last year, because the Chinese EPA, Environmental Protection, now has teeth. They're given the power to shut down power grids of petrochemical areas that are polluting. The middle class in China now has a voice that says, okay, Communist Party of China, we'll respect you if you stay in power, but our deal now is not only let me make the money, but let my children not die of lung cancer. So as a result, there's a lot of enforcement of uh, EPA and FDA rules, local Chinese rules, that are now being complied to, the cost of compliance has made it very expensive for factories to make a profit. Raw material costs have gone up, and finally the trade tariffs obviously make it more difficult as well. Um, I, I'm gonna go through this quickly because it's not relevant to this speech, but essentially my Shanghai-based sourcing office and production office is being stretched. Within China, it's easy. In three hours, I can get to any one of my factories by high-speed train, or fly if I need to. To cover India production or Vietnam production is stretching my supply chain, which means I'm probably going to take my office and move it to a Mumbai or a Singapore pretty soon. Uh, India, labor bus is cheaper, English language, uh, global certifications, they have all the food grade certifications I need. Um, there's a lot of maturing that India exporters need to uh, take on if they want to be able to compete for our business. A lot of challenges related to supply chain beyond physical infrastructure. A lot of it's just experience working with American companies, it takes time. Vietnam, uh, similar challenges, labor costs is increasing, very educated workforce. The problem really is the infrastructure hasn't caught up and um, uh, the not, as, not as frequent of transit calls, uh, uh, frequency of sailing vessels like Shanghai has. Um, last two slides, and I'm going a little overboard here, is China versus United States. And it doesn't have to be a competition, but it's become a competition. The U.S. wants to re retain its power over the world. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, it's just a reality. But it wants a fair trade, and Trump is catering to domestic uh, policies, or to support base. China wants respect. If you look historically from the invasions going back to the Opium Wars to England, to the U.S., Japan, Germany, France, uh, occupying parts of China, as recently as 56, I'm no, sorry, go back to 1930s, that's what, 80 years ago, China feels disrespected. So it's demanding its place on the world stage with respect. It wants to change the world order. It's not its best interest for WTO rules to stay as they are. 
It's more than happy for the U.S. to get out of TPP and allow it to run point on it. Um, it wasn't yeah, they'll be even happier if we do what the trade rep wants and takes us out of the WTO. I agree. So China wants a diversified markets. It doesn't want to be reliant on the U.S. So in some ways, Trump is doing China a favor by forcing the issue. Um, this, this map is way too, this graph is way too busy as my last slide, but I do recommend, and I hope I can say it right, my daughter's gonna kill me if I get it wrong, to sit in this trap. Um, it basically says that if, as you have an existing world power, or even regional power, and a new power comes up on the stage, what happens? Is there room for two at the table, or does it lead to a real confrontation, a real physical war with military involved? And what it basically says on this map is 12 out of 16 times it's led to war. And the last, more recently, it's not led to war. Perfect example had been, you can use Japan in World War II. Some could argue, if you take your emotions and heart out of it, and look at it historically, Japan had no choice, because the US had a blockade around it, choking it from oil in the 30s and 40s, for many reasons, maybe many valid reasons. Japan had no choice but to fight its way out of it, right? It lost. But some of these issues that start with the trade tariff war can lead to war, and I gotta tell you, that scares the heck out of me. Well, the, the, the author of this book, Graham Allison, a, a Harvard professor, is uh, not predicting war. Uh, Graham is saying that if, if things don't change, uh, it could lead to conflict, but uh, as rational people, we could uh, change some policies along the way, but, but he's afraid of that. Okay, thank you. Of course, Jeff. I mean, I think it's fascinating that the movement of the supply chain, because I know the administration really wants to negotiate an FTA with the Philippines. They're, I think they're close to potentially announcing one, and they're looking at potential FTAs with countries in Africa. But if Chinese factories are going to be opening up in those countries, and are, so what's the administration going to do? Because I know for the solar tariffs and washers and steel and aluminum, those had global reach because they wanted to make sure that China could set up factories in other markets and circumvent the tariffs. So those countries are not going to agree as a condition of an FTA with the U.S. not to accept Chinese investment. Exactly. So we're going to have to figure our way out of this. I, mean, I can give a perfect example. Um, a, a sister industry to ours are the, if you buy dog food or horse feed bag, these big BOPP bags, like a 25-pound bag of dog food, they have the shiny print on it. China was accused of uh, dumping those on the U.S. market about 10 years ago. So they had a 300% countervailing type of duty on it. What happened? That moved to Vietnam. The lamination imprint is still being made in Shandong province. It's shipping to Vietnam to be placed on these same bags run by Chinese factories in Vietnam. That's already happened. So what you just described is already the reality. And that's what Absolutely correct. Right. Absolutely correct. Right. And, and that's what uh, PG was talking about, too. Companies move operations. The key point that Dan made, I'd just like to, to highlight, is that labor costs are only part of production costs. And infrastructure and transportation are incredibly important um, in, in terms of locating things. So if one moves factories solely for labor costs, you're in for big surprises. You've got to think on all of these things. Guido. What I would like you to talk about, at least start with, is what is Brexit and what is that going to do to supply chains and business operations? So I work for our companies uh, basically operating on the biggest group of LTL operator in Europe uh, with 27,000 people, uh, 400, 400 uh, branches and uh, 3,500 point pairs. It's, it's a very balanced network because when you operate a network, you have to have it very balanced. So at that stage, the UK business is running perfectly. So we don't see yet any change, no in the orders, no in the behaviors. So that it's, it's some sort of calm. So there's an, there's an agreement that everything runs as it is. Um, the question would be what if we would have then hard borders in the future, what would that really make or give to that, uh, that, uh, that network or impose to that network? And there's there are technical challenges because today uh, a big percentage of the, the transfers of goods are running through the channel, to the tunnel, and uh, there's no parking space. Very simple things. Because if you have a hot board and you control every truck, uh, what's on a truck, and you in Europe still the documents are traveling with the truck, um, you would really create a big traffic jam, you know, going up to London, I guess. So that, that is not a practical solution. So they're talking about electronic borders. 
uh, detach the physical flow of goods from the really from the from, from the documentation to make really spot checks. Um, there's a lot of questions nobody can answer yet, but it's it's rather calm and I just attend board meetings. I'm not I'm not attending any meetings with Emmanuel or with, uh, with Angela. So in our board meetings, basically, we do not expect like a like a big major disaster. So, so you, you do not anticipate a hard Brexit? No. In, even there would be a hard Brexit from a supply chain perspective, we would still deal with it. It's, a, it, it's something that you have to add maybe more, more uh, drivers, and that is really the real issue in Europe. We have a huge driver shortage as we have it in the US, and to find drivers it's really hard, and then to guarantee that as well the transit times, and, and really uh, be part of the supply chain that you have a uh, a guaranteed transit time of 12 hours or 24 hours as our, uh, our customers use us. That's then very difficult. It's a challenge. It's adding more challenges to already existing <coughs> problems we have entering the cities in, in, in Europe uh, with, with a diesel thing. So these, these are real issues. And if you add another issue or complication by crossing the border, of course, it's delaying the supply chain and the cost money. So I guess at the end of the day, the consumer, we are paying those things which are not perfect. Right? So, so Brexit soft or hard is going to make the European system less efficient? Definitely. And, and obviously, as well, automotive companies like, like Jaguar announced it because they really have a global supply chain. They cannot afford to pay duties or taxes on their goods. They eventually will move their platform to Hungary or whatever. Can you give us a, uh, a thumbnail sketch of what your European customers or suppliers think about U.S. trade uh, policy or U.S. trade pronouncements? And I can tell you that is it, I'm German, native German, so I still follow the German news. It's not a single evening where Mr. Trump is not the news, and nobody understands it. So for, 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 for a German person, America was always like a big role model of this, you have to be the, starting from the democratic approach, starting from the way of living, and this is like such a big shift that people are really confused about the messages. And uh, when they meet together that even that the leader of, of the free world is going to a plane and texting whatever we discussed here was not what we discussed, calling uh, the Canadian leader a liar, it's disturbing. Okay, let's move from Europe to Latin America. <laughs> Ricardo, tell us a little bit about what's driving growth in Latin America and, and also... So, let me give you just a quick perspective of where Latin America stands today. Can I have yes. one, please? Thank you. In regards of uh, economy size, Okay, so today, as of today, Brazil and Mexico are ranked uh, economies number 8 and 15 among the uh, top 20 economies in the world in regards of uh, GDP. Uh, for the last 20 years, Brazil and Mexico have had the right path to have a stronger influence uh, in global economy. And if they continue doing things things as they have had for the last 20 years, they are projected to become economies number seven and number eight by the year 2050. Obviously, this path has not been uh, easy, and the challenges and the uncertainty that Latin America is living today in regards of global economies uh, means that Latin America needs to be very careful how we manage things in the future. In the case of Mexico, uh, the country needs to maximize its current geopolitical and economical position since we have a strong uh, uh, position managing our resources and our strategic location gives, gives us advantage, uh, advantages that we need to maximize in the future. All these put together has allowed Mexico to sign more than 12 uh, free trade agreements with more than 50 countries uh, in the last, uh, during the last 10 years. Um, obviously, NAFTA being a priority number one for Mexico today, uh, due to its worth, which is close to $21 trillion, 
or close to 26% of the global GDP. In order for Mexico to continue maximizing uh, its current global trade environment, uh, there has to be ongoing investment in commercial infrastructure to uh, strengthen ports, airports, highways, and this needs to be funded by ongoing uh, capital investment and spending power. And this needs to be a priority since uh, today we have a strong relationship with North America, in this case the US and Canada, where uh, we have more than 500 million uh, border crossings every year. So that gives you a magnitude of uh, how Mexico needs to maximize today its current position in order to continue growing and having more influence in the global trade environment. The case of Brazil is a little bit different. Today, Brazil needs to increase its global presence uh, since to, uh, global trade. Since today, imports and exports represent only 25% of the country's GDP, compared to Mexico's 70, 75, and Chile's 65. So Brazil needs to continue removing trade barriers that so far have restricted uh, local companies from uh, having more opportunities, local opportunities, and foreign competition. In the end, Latin America is looking to have more foreign competition. We foresee that as an enabler uh, to uh, increase productivity and to increase efficiencies, which in the end will generate more jobs in the region. Uh, especially for those uh, low uh, skills, lower income uh, uh, roles across the region, which in the end we drive growth, but in an inclu inclusive manner. So this is a priority also for local governments in the region to have growth driven by uh, inclusion. There are three key enablers that the region needs to focus on uh, and needs to have clear strategies to address the challenges that we are facing. The first one is to find ways and clear strategies to create competitive labor, an abundance of competitive labor. And this must be a priority since today, Latin America has a very young population which ranges from 60 to 75% of the total population. So this is an opportunity, but also an asset since in the future we foresee having generating uh, production sustainability and abundance of competitive labor. The challenge is that this current rate will continue increasing uh, in the coming years, with Mexico uh, increasing more than 26% its current young population, working population. So we foresee having ranges from 80 to 85% of uh, our population uh, 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 as a working age uh, standard. The second priority for the region would be to drive productivity to become the principal engine of growth. We foresee uh, uh, the creation of more and better remunerated jobs by becoming more productive. So improvements in, pro in productivity need help by having significant higher investments in microeconomic and legislative reforms. So putting those together, uh, we foresee Mexico and Brazil becoming more productive in the next coming years. The third area of uh, achievement that uh, Latin America, and in this case Mexico and Brazil, need to focus on is to have important legislative reforms that uh, could increase uh, foreign investment and overall GDP uh, by having a positive impact on the business climate. As an example, since 2013, Mexico has had a series of the legislative reforms that are expected to boost GDP by two points uh, in the next, uh, from 2013 to 2015, moving from an average of 2.5 to 2.8 GDP growth to an expected 4.4, 4.5 GDP growth by 2018. So those three are the key aspects that need to be uh, uh, managed by Latin America in general, in order to have a more present and a stronger uh, influence in global trade environment. What we foresee happening uh, for the business uh, in Latin America is that we expect supply chains also to evolve uh, accordingly in order to have that 
level of influence in, uh, in, global mar in local markets. Before, uh, logistics was seen as a com competitive ed enabler that just to operate efficiently by reducing poor cost and overall working capital to reduce overall, overall time in the supply chain. So the value was seen to increase margins for a company. But in the future, uh, competitive companies will use supply chains and logistics in Latin America to develop and support new businesses, as well as to increase sales and market share, uh, improving, improving service and constant consumer loyalty. So we expect uh, supply chains, and especially logistics, uh, to evolve in this way in order to be aligned to the future challenges that we foresee uh, for, for the region. So in summary, there is a lot of room for improvement. Mexico and Brazil have strengths that are among the world's most extensive. Many are betting on these two countries uh, with a lot of expectations for great success. But we have opportunities that today are real. So Latin America's future depends on having more citizen participation to strengthen the rule of law, eliminate, eliminate corruption, improve education, and drive entrepreneurship. Ricardo, one, one question. Uh, your, your chart about Mexican GDP growth with the four or five different reforms taking it from 2.5% up to 4.5%, four, four that depends on drastically on, on political order and, and political continuity. And one looks at the, the, the president elect of Mexico as a, a person that's certainly different than previous presidents. And one looks at the political morass in Brazil. And do you think under the new administration coming in to Mexico or whatever comes out of the Brazilian political system that you can have these reforms going forward? We don't know yet. Uh, it's, it's fluid. Yes, uh, but we have been surprised. You know, uh, we had a, a drastic change in Mexico moving from a uh, uh, conservative party to a more liberal party. Uh, by 53% um, of the population voted for this party. So there is a lot of expectation, but so far what the new candidate has done is to uh, say, send the same messages, positive messages, that the previous uh, government had. So that has created uh, confidence for continuity uh, to uh, maintain what Mexico has done for the last 20 years. So, but we need to wait until December until he gets into the office and starts taking decisions. But what we have seen so far has created confidence uh, in that regard. Okay. Thank you. PJ, tell us about the supply chain shifts that you see as a uh, Singaporean investor and, and, and now as a professor. Okay, uh, so uh, I think Daniel has already spoken a lot about the shifts of uh, manufacturing. So I just wanted to show a survey that was done by the Financial Times. And uh, basically they, they surveyed a bunch of companies and looked at uh, you know, where they want to move their manufacturing uh, you know, out, if they want to move out of China, where they want to go. Right? So in the past, we had this model of you know, China being the factory of the world. And I think because of changes in the cost structure, the rising cost structure in China, and also uh, you know, the fact that their own population is growing older as well, uh, companies are looking for alternatives. So uh, in this survey, uh, you, know, they, they, you, you can see that, for example, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia is very much uh, on top uh, of the list. But uh, my point around that is also that uh, there are no single alternatives to, uh, you know, to the next factor of the world, in a sense. Uh, you know, uh, you know, so it's going to be spread out among uh, uh, probably a few countries. So you can think of Vietnam as probably uh, you know uh, a destination for export and growth because of the cheaper labor cost, uh, you know, uh, cost structure and, and uh, relatively good infrastructure and stable economy. And whereas countries like Indonesia, uh, with a 250 million population, would would attract investments because of 
you know, uh, the, the need for being in the domestic market, right, rather than to export into the Indonesian market itself. So, so we are likely to see, in a sense, that fragmentation, at least within uh, the Asian landscape for, for manufacturing. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, my, my own take is that uh, export-led growth will become harder. Uh, if you think about export-led growth uh, to the West, right, which has been the traditional model for how uh, a lot of Asian uh, economies actually, uh, you know, move up uh, in, 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 in their wealth, I think that, uh, you know, because of uh, recent kind of trends, it, it would become harder. Uh, you know, but it doesn't mean that uh, it would stop, right? And, and, and to some extent, uh, uh, countries and companies find their own way, right? So, uh, you know, uh, this, this is talking about, uh, in fact, uh, uh, for example, Vietnam trying to move up the value chain uh, into more innovation, and at the same time, they, would, uh, they have also signed a number of uh, FTAs. So, like, uh, like uh, you know, like Mexico, for example, uh, Vietnam has also signed FTAs with European Union, they have FTAs with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, South Korea, right? So, so they, they are creating avenues that they can then use uh, to, you know, to, to have more, you know, to have trade uh, relations and trade avenues for, for, for the exports as well, right? So, so these are things that actually, uh, you know, a lot of countries are doing right, to adapt. Okay, and uh, at the same time, so the other thing that, that we can see is uh, a lot of domestic markets uh, investment would actually uh, you know, happen as well. Um, and, and these are a couple examples of uh, electronics uh, manufacturing that is being done in India. So uh, I'm sure many of you heard of the Made in India initiatives that came up uh, you know, uh, a few years ago with the new uh, uh, Indian government. So uh, they have actually managed to attract a lot of the smartphone manufacturers, so like Smoke Foxconn, uh, now uh, Chinese companies like Huawei and Xiaomi uh, into India as well. Uh, you know, uh, of course, there are still challenges with bringing the whole supply chain there, but you can see that companies like that are actually moving in to, uh, in a way, uh, capture the domestic uh, market opportunities of a, a 1 billion uh, population. Right? And, and of course, the same thing for Indonesia as well, uh, for the automotive companies. Uh, you know, uh, so companies like uh, Hyundai and uh, uh, Kia, you know, Korean car companies are very, very big uh, in, in the, and of course the Japanese car companies are very big in Indonesia, right, um, to target the domestic markets, you know, so of course automotives is not something that you can <laughs> make in one part of the world and export everywhere, right, so, so you know, because of the logistics cost, so they would actually uh, put manufacturing plants in those countries. Okay, and uh, uh, the other point that uh, you know I thought would be uh, that could be made is that uh, also a lot of these investments are no longer just for low cost uh, manufacturing, but uh, uh, for uh, low cost labor, but to some extent also to invest into what is called the new economy, into innovation, into IT. Uh, you know, in, in, in venture capital investments as well, right? So uh, you, you have, uh, you know, companies like Xiaomi and Foxconn uh, putting on record that uh, uh, the reason why they're in India, for example, is not just for the low-cost manufacturing or domestic markets, but to actually invest into, uh, you know, the startup companies over there uh, and, and, and uh, you know, and, and to actually take part in that, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in those uh, new venture kind of uh, uh, companies and uh, the chart over here actually shows uh, Southeast Asia uh, venture capital investments. So you can see that as of 20 and 2012, it was very much dominated by Singapore as you know as a uh, as a place for uh, investments into uh, startups and innovation uh, and technologies. Um, you know, um, by 2016, Singapore of course uh, still accounts for a large chunk. Uh, you know, so in absolute value, everybody has grown. But you, keep, you can see that, uh, you know, within Southeast Asia, Indonesia has, has grown a lot. Uh, you know, so, so in the last couple of years, uh, Indonesia has actually created a couple of unicorns as well for, uh, in, 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 in the venture and innovation space. And more companies are looking at, uh, at that as well. So there is also the aspect of uh, uh, innovation investments and not just uh, 
uh, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, investments. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the audience to have its turn asking questions or, or commenting on something you've heard so far. Wake up. Yes, ma'am. Um, Courtney Thompson, Inventory Supervisor with Medical Distribution. Um, Ricardo, this question is mainly for you in the Mexico and Latin America community. In the medical industry, we have quite a number of manufacturing facilities in Mexico where more delays have been seen due to unrest or more political spectrum at the borders. Do you see this having any negative impact on Mexico distribution into the U.S. Um, within the future? Yes, I think it has had a negative impact on distribution. Fortunately, the country uh, is living now equal to a security situation, which has been addressed uh, for the last five to ten years. Uh, we recognize that. Uh, but what we have seen is that the government has taken the right action to address the security issues in very specific regions in the country. So this is not happening all over the country. It's happening in very specific areas where uh, proper actions have taken place. Yes, there is impact on distribution. Next question. In the back, microphone's coming. Uh, I, I do, do like thank the, the uh, uh, like quite like deep uh, presentation about like Chinese uh, manufacturing. So I have another question is that uh, it's like uh, since uh, like I do, there are like low add-on industries that are moving out of China, but we also observe that like, there are also like car manufacturers like Audi and BMW are keep investing in China, in China. So like, uh, my question is, what opportunities do you see in uh, manufacturing in China in the next like five to 10 years? Dan, would you like to I guess I guess first start with that? Uh, essentially, don't ignore the fact that the Chinese domestic market is huge and growing very quickly, probably the fastest in the world comparing economy versus economy. The demand for automobiles in Chinese fourth, fifth, and sixth tier cities. The definition of tier cities, if you're not familiar with it, a sixth tier city is bigger than Philadelphia, right? These are multi-million population cities. Like a city of Changzhou with five, six million people you never heard of. There's like 100 cities like that in China. And as the middle class grows, the demand for automobiles grows. The demand for clothing, electronics, other consumer goods grows. It's a very desirable market. And a recent survey at the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai illustrated the most successful companies, whether they're American, European, or Chinese domestic companies across the board, are those that have a balanced trade. They're in China, manufacturing for Western market, Asian market, most importantly, for the Chinese market as well. So why, are the, why is Tesla setting up 100% wholly owned plant in China. Why did BMW just come in two weeks ago, announce a 70% owned factory in China? One, the rules changed. Two, because there's a huge domestic demand for those automobiles and other products. So to answer your question, there's always gonna be a demand for manufacturing in China, increasingly for the China domestic market, secondarily for non-US destination markets as those markets grow. Dan, why, why is not Tesla or Audi or Many others worried about losing their intellectual property. Phew, that's a hot potato. Um, there's a concern and valid that American companies that have uh, desirable technology are either getting hacked and having that technology stolen, uh, or getting copied with intellectual property rights not being respected. Uh, a lot of non-tariff barriers of being forced technology transfer. These, the China 2025 strategy put it on the table very clearly that it wants to become a dominant player and not, not reliant on U.S. technology, right? So if I were uh, a U.S. owner of IP and high, highly desirable modern technology, I'd be worried to. So why is Elon Musk best in China? I think he has no choice. There's money there. There's a lot of money there. He's draining cash quickly. Um, there's a huge market potential there. 
Uh, and, he's, and because of pressure from the Trump administration, and because of um, Elon Musk's desire to sell to the Chinese market, made in China to avoid the tariffs, he has no choice but to be there to take advantage of that market. So he's not overly worried about intellectual property. He's figuring out ways to protect himself or to change the technology enough to better. I, I, I just think he realizes what a smart guy he is, that he can stay as an inventor and keep the technology ball rolling and is willing to share openly and lose some of his present technology because he knows he's going to come up with a new one. And he's got to survive as a company. That's a practical decision. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's going to be more domestic investment in China, um, especially because of the, the CFIUS reform bill that, that the president is going to sign. It's going to make it harder for China to invest in the U.S. That money has to go somewhere, so it's going to stay in China. Until Jeff, it's just briefly right. explain what CFIUS is. So there's a Treasury-led committee that evaluates foreign uh, investments in the United States. And uh, the reform bill that just passed is going to increase the number of transactions that are, that are subject to that review. So including now if you're, if you're potentially buying into a US company as a minority shareholder, they can take a look at that. So in the past, this committee only reviewed things that were considered to be threats to national security. And now it's a much broader review process that they probably go on. And they're broadening export controls as well for other types of technology. So that, that's causing companies to think about, if they haven't already done it, to invest in China, to produce in China. So the, the cutoff of Qualcomm's uh, uh, chips to ZTE, which happened in March, and then got rescinded because she and Trump talked to each other, and, and Mr. Trump was worried about losing a lot of jobs in China doubles and triples the rate at which China wants to build its own chips. Now, of course, they violated a number of embargoes and stuff, and, and they should have been penalized, but they complicated questions. Other questions? Yes, sir, right here. And then the next question in the back of the white shirt. Good morning. Uh, you had talked about the Chinese government wanted to be able to save face um, and not give in to the U.S.'s basic demands. Um, is there anything that you've heard of or anything that they could potentially do on maybe more on the kind of hidden end to release or excuse me to relieve any of the, uh, the tariff increases that American companies would feel such as for example you know manipulating the currency slightly or offering a higher VAT rebate for the exports from the Chinese manufacturers. Have you heard anything like that, or, or is there any kind of conversation about that thing where it maybe wouldn't necessarily, they could still save face, but still also, you get what I'm saying? That's a very good question. Um, you might know the answer is better than me, but I'll take a first stab at it. First off, the RMB has depreciated from roughly 6.1 to today at 6.8, right? So that's, I'm using that against my suppliers right now and saying, give me my price breaks. Essentially, it, in US dollar terms, if you're buying FOB port China, your cost of manufacturing has dropped by 10% in US dollar terms. And that was reactive, not so much to make the tariffs less effective, but more the end game to not let factories shut down. Again, bear in mind, what does the leadership in China care most about? Staying in power, stability. The last thing it needs is 100 million young people on the streets unemployed. Right? So it will do what it has to do to placate its domestic needs before it cares about the United States. Its biggest worry is not being invaded by a foreign power. Its biggest, biggest worry is civil war, because historically that's what's happened. So it will do what it has to do to survive. So as you said, foreign exchange rate, that's not happening by accident. That's certainly being manipulated, even though market forces are short. Um, the, the next point you made is uh, value-added tax rebates on exports. That's already happening. Um, if I export a product and I, I pay the 17% VAT with the China right now, I get about 15% of that back already. Think, think to bear in mind in China, a lot of the manufacturing are over half, probably more close to 70%, are, are being done by state-owned enterprises. And the definition of state in China could be federal, could be provincial, could be municipal. So they're very state players, right? It's kind of like our post office or military or, or public education. These are state-owned enterprises in America. They play a much larger role in China. 
they receive subsidies because often a lot of these companies are sister companies to banks that can essentially just print money or borrow money and it squeezes out the private sector. So during these times of restrictions or threat to the economy, they certainly add fuel to these companies to keep them going to support them. The brick one, one, one Belt, One Road is a perfect example of the investments China's making in Pakistan and Myanmar and Sri Lanka and other parts of mostly Asia, but moving to Central Asia as well. Those create Chinese jobs, and it takes the focus off the United States. It also allows them to create future trade partners and future political alliances. Uh, which, which is, is very critical. critical. So, so China's, China's basic, basic, as I was alluding to before, before this, this is a natural, natural process which is already underway. The, the tariffs, tariffs being implemented by the United States is just pushing that process to happen quicker. So, so to answer your question, question, I think China's, China's making a lot of these moves. moves. But getting back to what I said earlier about Tesla and BMW, a lot of the pressure now being given by the Trump administration to China actually is effective. Three years ago, even one year ago, it would have been impossible for an American company like Tesla to set up a plant in China and own more than 50%. And General Motors joint venture is a perfect example of that. They tried to buy more, they were blocked from doing so. Today, you can. You can own 100% of your own plant as an automobile factory. That's a success factor, which, I mean, if I was in Washington, D.C. right now, I'd be raising the flag and said, we won a battle, we won one. But nobody's saying that, unfortunately, because it's still going on. So I think there, are, there is progress being made, and I think China's being very aggressive to protect itself as it should. So I would mention currency devaluation as well. I think it's 10 percent since at since, least since at April. Least. Since April, yep. 12 percent. 12 percent. Um, so that might have been a factor in why the president decided to consider ask the U.S. to consider 25 percent tariffs versus 10 percent tariffs to try to offset that. So that's probably one of the things that they took into consideration before they came out with that. Um, but there are certainly other things that could be done without fingerprints uh, in terms of merger review anti dumping countervailing duty case initiation. There's, there's flexibility in terms of the duties, the all office rate, for example. So there are plenty of things that we anticipate they could do or may have already done because they can't match us dollar for dollar on the, uh, on the tariff increases. The other variable which, which scares me, and I hope it doesn't happen, is what happened a couple years ago with South Korea and to a lesser extent with Japan as well, when they had geopolitical concerns over the, uh, was it the THAAD missiles that the U.S. put in, yeah, THAAD missiles in South Korea, and then the, the dispute over islands in the East China Sea with Japan, it was very easy for China's um, PR machine to come out and say, stop buying their products, stop buying Starbucks coffee, stop visiting American, flying on American airlines or supporting American businesses. They are our economic enemy, support other countries that are more friendly to us. That spigot has not been turned on yet, and that could lead to anti-American sentiment in China. Sentiment, I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but that wouldn't shock me. Well, the, the way they turn on and off is tourism. So group tourism to Korea went like this after the fact. Group tourism to Japan went like that. Southern California will be hurt. Got a question in the back, and then a question here, and then I think it's Question in the back, and a question here, and then we'll see if we have time for this one. Uh, person in a white shirt. So a quick question and brief response. Lunch is coming up. My name is Yong Yang. Uh, I, I work, at a, work as a director of operations on uh, Cooked on Apparel. Um, as a manufacturer for apparel industry, uh, what I see is we, we have two manufacturing locations. We provide two country of origins, one from Indonesia, one from Mexico. And usually before, um, we didn't have much of um, room to, room in terms of like a free trade agreements. You know, there was no, not much of flexibility. But what I'm seeing right now is like it's becoming a spaghetti ball of free trade agreements everywhere. And, and within those free trade agreements, uh, can you provide some kind of supply chain metrics shift uh, in terms of a sourcing point of view uh, in each country or each region like due to these kind of free trade agreements, uh, the talks, in negotiations? Well, I think the proliferation of FTAs is because we, we've been stuck at the WTO level, not able to address some of these issues on a, on a global basis. I think that's going to continue. 
and I think the administration wants to focus on bilateral deals when it can, so we'll probably do more of that. In terms of specifically looking at supply chain metrics and, and FTAs, I think that's going back to the point I made earlier, which, which is that that's not considered part of trade policy right now. The closest they get is customs rules, and I think we need to move in that direction and take, take that into account. Question over here. Good morning. My name is George Arbery. I'm part of Cohort 6. Uh, just a quick question. One area of the world has not been mentioned in this discussion is Africa. I just want to know if you can touch on that briefly. Uh, was it Guido or, or uh, Dan? First that as well. Um, I just know within China today, a lot of my peers who are in textile manufacturing in particular are speaking of four countries right now um, that are, are booming. The strongest one is Ethiopia, especially because of the recent peace accords with Eritrea and, and Somalia, those three countries in particular. That's a hot spot for textile growth, and a lot of Chinese manufacturing in Ethiopia today are moving plants to Ethiopia uh, today. That's a fantastic opportunity for Eastern Africa. I'm also hearing a lot about Nigeria and Ghana and Western Africa. A lot has to do with proximity to the United States with direct sailings. Um, uh, th th that's another opportunity where it's just booming and growth. Just to share that with you, that's the only thing I've heard from Texel. So basically, we, we can follow the supply chain. So if you see the massive ports and massive container movements, you still have a lot of China, massive. And we say huge growth in India, but India, the whole output is not as big as the port of Ningbo. And so China will continue to be a big power, the big factory of the world, even the shift, it will replace maybe by other industries, and the shipping is going to be there. In Africa, we don't see that even there, there are parts of growth, not to that extent. Final questions, gentlemen in the blue shirt, the microphone's coming. As we've learned recently in our own company, uh, country, if you repeat something enough, sooner or later, later it gains a truth to it. So I'm looking at China, and I see what they're doing in the Japanese islands and in the Philippine islands, and I'm just wondering if this is, in your opinion, a future basis for them 400 years from now factually owning these places and having access to the resources that they're going to need for their growing populations. In other words, is their thinking so far ahead that they're actually planning 400 years from now? Now. Jeff, I think it's a question for you. Well, I think I'll just, again, going back to my, my, my big idea, I do think the U.S. needs to engage more in the region, and if it's not going to be TPP, I think it needs to be on infrastructure. Um, I think it's consistent with the U.S. national security strategy that came out last December to do that. Um, I think it would be on the infrastructure, on, on the physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure side. And I think working with, with allies in the region, um, like Australia and, uh, and Singapore and India, I think that we need to do that. Uh, I'm looking forward to having some discussions with uh, colleagues in the administration about that. I'd like to close with a comment on, on, on that question. Uh, there's a lot of people in the United States are saying China's unfair because it has a 2025 plan. China's unfair because it's going to invest in different technologies. Uh, you know, that's like saying to, to me, I, I used to play baseball and football, and that's like saying UCLA is unfair because they've decided to practice it until midnight. And, and my team wants to stop at 7 o'clock so we can go out and drink or something like that. It's not unfair for people to work hard. It's not unfair for people to, countries to invest in, in new technologies or invest long term. I mean, the, the America that I knew grew up with, we said, look, at, we'll, we'll compete with them, we'll, we'll out invest them. We'll put more into the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation. And, and develop these technologies. We will tell our industries, we want you to build the spacecraft that will take us to the moon. And, and we won't say to the Germans, you're not fair, you work too hard. We're going to say, we want to compete. And to compete, we have to invest. Um, if you go to the, to the website, 
of my program, the USC Marshall School IBER and the A program. There's a, a podcast series. It's called Business Class Podcast. And we've got five or six people in the last four or five months that have been interviewed and talked about China policy, U.S. China policy, including former Ambassador Gary Locke and, and Bill Zarat, the senior commercial officer there, and, and Jim McGregor. And, and these podcasts are quite interesting, talking about Chinese policy and U.S. policy and, and various businesses, why, why they're doing things. And, and I would suggest you might want to go to that and, and take a look at that. Uh, with that, but it is lunchtime, and my, my friends and colleagues, uh, Nick and Eric, are telling me, get off the stage, Nick. Uh, how about a round of applause for our panelists?